God stir up the gift inside of us. And what a pleasure it is to open up God's word. And I believe the Holy Spirit will indeed stir up something in us today, that it will be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Let us pray. Eternal God, we ask now that as you have already blessed us, that you will come by, by your spirit of, 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 um, of invocation, but your spirit, Lord, of revelation. Uh, let your word be opened up to us now and illumine our hearts to receive insight on what you say for us today. Thank you for what we've already received. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Today, we invite you to hear God's word, and most importantly, to receive God's word, coming to us from the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7 from a New King James Version of God's holy word. But the Bible says, I thank God whom I served with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see you, uh, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, we want to focus in on this passage in in 1 Timothy, as it comes to us today from God's word, giving a word to Timothy, Paul's disciple, Paul's uh, protege, but most importantly, a young preacher needing to be encouraged. For the Bible tells us, as Paul writes his final letter to Timothy, he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. And with the aid of the Holy Spirit, I want to lift up this text, and if we could put a tag on it this morning and preach from our subject, Three, the hard way. Three, the hard way. Power, love, and sound mind. My friends, I don't know if you are familiar with the story, and it, it may trigger up in your memory as I tell it, but I want to open up this sermon sharing that infamous story of the little boy who found himself outside playing one day, and he came across a fascinating caterpillar. He carefully picked it up and took it in the house, and he asked his mother, could he keep it? Could he care for it? And his mother said, sure, that would be a good idea. So he went to the cupboard, got a jar, and he put the caterpillar in the jar with some leaves and a stick. Uh, to his surprise and delight, the caterpillar began to eat the leaves, and one day as he came to look at the caterpillar in the jar, the caterpillar had climbed up the stick, and he began to do something that he had not seen before. He began worrying about what's going on. He summoned his mother, and his mother says, oh, son, that's okay. The caterpillar is making a cocoon, creating a cocoon. He, the mother explained to the son that by creating a cocoon, the caterpillar was going to go through a metamorphosis and become a butterfly, a caterpillar turning into a butterfly in a cocoon. Coon. The little boy was thrilled, y'all, to hear about the changes his caterpillar would go through. He watched every day, waiting for the butterfly to emerge. One day it happened. A, a small hole appeared in the cocoon, and the butterfly started to struggle coming out. 
At first, the boy was excited, y'all, but soon he became concerned. For the butterfly was struggling so hard to get out, uh, it, it looked like he couldn't break free. It looked desperate. It, it looked like it was making no progress. And the boy was concerned, so he decided, y'all, to help. He ran to get some scissors, and then he walked back because he was told, don't run with scissors. And he got to the cocoon, and he snipped the cocoon to make the hole bigger for the butterfly to quickly emerge. As the butterfly came out, y'all, the boy was surprised. It, it, it had a swollen body and small, shriveled wings. He continued to watch the butterfly, expecting that at any moment the wings would, 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 would spread out and dry out and enlarge and expand and support the swollen body of this butterfly. He knew that in time the body would shrink and the butterfly wings would develop and expand. You see, but nothing happened, y'all. The butterfly spent the rest of his life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It never had a chance to be what it was designed to be. It never was able to fly as the boy tried to figure out what had gone wrong. He, he, he tried to understand why didn't the butterfly develop, and he learned later on that the butterfly was supposed to struggle. Let me say that again. He learned later on that the butterfly was supposed to struggle. In fact, the butterfly struggled, y'all, to push through that cocoon, that opening in the cocoon. That butterfly would then push the fluids out of its body into the wings, and the wings would develop. Without the struggle, the butterfly would never, ever fly. The, the boy's good intentions hurt the butterfly, y'all, and our good intentions sometimes can do the very same thing. Why? When we take matters into our hands, we can abort what we ought to develop into. When we become the God of our own lives, we can abort the God of our creation. When we try to jump out too early instead of staying at home, we can mess up our own. Somebody hear what I'm saying because it's it's important for us to recognize there is a process in life and there's a process in our development. Let me come get you because you see, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. I got to say it again. From the words of Frederick Douglass, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those, he says, who, who profess to favor freedom and yet de deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its mighty waves. Hear what I'm saying with there is no struggle, there is no progress. Now, Dr. Frederick Douglass went on to say that this struggle that he was speaking of, uh, emancipation, this struggle to which he was lifting up of uh, freeing enslaved Africans, this struggle as an abolitionist, he said it may be a moral one and it may be a physical one and it may be both physical and moral, but it must be a struggle. Y'all missing that. He said back then in the 1800s, when when it comes to liberating and, and, and celebrating and giving freedom to those who are in bondage, it may be moral, it may be physical, it may be both, but it will be a struggle. And I want to talk to somebody this Sunday morning who think that it's all life is on a bed of ease. I want to speak into somebody's life who does not understand that you got to go through in order to get to. I need to speak a word to somebody who who may be de de depressed or may be down or maybe not feeling good about yourself because you find yourself climbing up the rough side of 
of the mountain. I just want you to celebrate this morning that you got strength to climb. I need you to celebrate this Sunday morning that you got a mountain to climb. I need you to celebrate this Sunday morning and thank God that we can stand on the shoulders of men and women, our big mamas and our big dads who did not have any of the niceties that we have, but they climb and they kept on climbing. There's going to be some struggle in life, and do know in the struggle, God will see you through. Do know in the struggle, God will give you strength. Do know in the struggle, my friends, that God has a way of pulling us out. Somebody ought to say amen for your struggle. Somebody ought to give God praise that you are still here in that struggle. Paul, y'all, identifies himself as an apostle, uh, an apostle right into his son Timothy in the ministry. He says, as an authorized uh, messenger of Christ Jesus, Paul writes this letter to Timothy. And Paul, understand, y'all, did not apply for this job. He served in this role because it was God's will. I got to say that again. Paul, he didn't apply for the persecution. He didn't fill out a resume and said, I want to be pushed and I want to be beat and I want to be stoned for the gospel. It was all a part of God's will. And recognize, my friends, many times in our lives, we may not ask for it, but once we are called, we will definitely be empowered to do it. I never forget the understand the true statement, y'all. God doesn't call the qualified, but God qualifies the call. And again, we, we need to recognize this is both a motivation message and a mission message for his son, Timothy. What you're saying, Reverend, you see, when you're called by Almighty God, blessings are in your future. When you fulfill the call of Almighty God, blessings are in your life. Let me say it like this, friends. Don't pray for God to bless what you are doing. Find out what God is blessing and be a part of it. You see, Paul's letter to Timothy is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, his son in the ministry, this is, is in essence a, 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 a final benediction, a salutation and a benediction to him in his ministry. Paul wants Timothy to know that he thinks God think, thanks God every time he remembers him in his prayers. Is that not good news that the first words that come off of somebody's lip when they meet you is I thank God for you? Isn't that good news to accept the fact that somebody's praying for you, have you on their mind, taking the time and praying for you? That's what I enjoy about our prayer calls in the morning, y'all, because somebody is praying for you. Somebody's lifting up your family. Somebody's lifting up your co-workers. Somebody is lifting up your community. Somebody is lifting up the leaders of our city and in our county and our state and our country and our world. It's good to know that prayer changes things. But again, recognize, y'all, is that God calls us to prayer because God blesses us through the prayer process. What you're saying, Reverend, here's your tweet for the week. God blesses those who get excited about God's plan to bless the world through Jesus. God blesses you to bless those when you get excited about sharing the good news about Jesus. Paul, y'all, had a deep affection for this young man, Timothy, and Paul wanted him to serve faithfully in the ministry. Paul says, Timothy, I remember your tears, perhaps tears shared the last time we met. Timothy, I remember how you longed to see me and how I longed to see you. In essence, Paul is saying, and Timothy, I know it's going to be rough, but I'm going to give you three the hard way. Three the hard way. It comes to Timothy. For Timothy, I want you to know that you have a strong, sincere faith in Jesus Christ, inspired by your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. This, I want you to understand this. This serves as a reminder of how important the godly heritage of the family is. Let me say that again, church. 
Paul lifts up the grandmother and the mother in Timothy's life and his faith. The family unit, y'all, is God's first foundational institution for the transfer of the faith. What you're saying, Reverend, I'm saying it's in the family that we learn how to teach our children and our children's children the word of Almighty God. It's in the family when the family has a solid foundation on the word of Almighty God. I, I need to speak to somebody here, particular some parent who is worried about your child, some grandparent who is praying over your grandchild. Yes, do know that when they are young, we tell our children about God but let me tell you when we get old we tell God about our children you ought to give somebody a high five right there particularly if you praying for Junebug and praying for Nisi and praying for Skeeter and praying for Guan to come back to the Lord talk to God have a little talk with Jesus tell him all about your troubles he will hear your faintest cry and answer by and by this passage y'all is also powerful because it talks about the presence of women in somebody else's life. Let me say that again. I don't know what Timothy's daddy was. It's not mentioned. I don't know if he was not there, a part of the faith. But sisters, I want you to know that God still speaks through you to speak to somebody else to give life to them all. It's critical, my friends, that we understand that parents and grandparents pass along the faith. Big mama, it ain't your job just to watch the child while the child watches television. Cut the television off, big mama, and teach the child the word of Almighty God. Mothers, it's not your job just to take them to an activity. Be the activity in their life. And fathers, if you hear what I'm saying, if you're not there, show up. Because when you show up, your child can see what it means to have a father figure in their life. Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And Paul talks to the struggles of young Timothy. He talks about his timidity, probably resulted, y'all, from a variety of factors. But Paul lets it be known that Timothy, when you come into trouble, Timothy, when you get knocked down, Timothy, when you get discouraged, do not have the spirit of fear, but have the spirit of power and of love and of three the hard way, three the hard way. Okay, I'm sure some old school folk are trying to figure out how in the world did you name this sermon three the hard way because Reverend when I hear three the hard way I go back to 1974 with Jim Brown and Jim Kelly and Fred Williamson. I, I know you're talking about those brothers from the 70s who made this movie three the hard way and it is that's where I got the Genesis point from this sermon title because it was that movie from 1974 when Jim Brown, record producer, and Fred Williamson, a PR man, and Jim Kelly, this black belt, y'all, these three brothers combined together to fight against the man. And the man had a plot. It was basically a movie about a neo-fascist organization who had a plot, y'all, to for the purpose of killing all the black folk in Los Angeles and Detroit and Washington, D.C. They were putting poison in the water. Now, this was a movie in 74, but they wanted to eradicate and eliminate all African Americans in these chocolate cities, Los Angeles, Detroit, and Washington. And you say, Reverend, how in the world can you talk about a 1974 movie in 2020? Well, I got to bring it up because that we're going to be a church of justice and a church to advocate righteousness, we've got to speak to the things of unjust and things that are unright. What you're saying, I'm talking about African Americans disproportionately, dis, 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 disproportionately are affected by the coronavirus. Okay, 
How did you get that? Well, the CDC made the report, y'all. It says the COVID-19 virus, y'all, is disproportionately affecting African-American communities, so much so they are alarmed. This epidemic, this pandemic, y'all, has come upon cities like Los Angeles, like Chicago, like Detroit, like Washington, D.C., like Charlotte, North Carolina, disproportionately affecting African Americans. Is it that the man is trying to get rid? No, no, I'm not putting out any conspiracy theories, but I am saying it's because we do not have health care in our community. We do not have adequate food, food in our community. We do not have issues that help fight diabetes and high blood pressure. Yes, so when we get a cold in the black community, it's like catching pneumonia with the white community gets us a cold. We have to do something about this, even in this pan when we get back to a normal. We cannot let black children and brown children go without adequate health care. When we get back to our new normal, we cannot pretend as though we don't need to provide health care for all people, red, yellow, black, and and white, we are precious in God's sight. You see, when you look at three the hard way, not just the movie, I need you to look at the word of Almighty God. For the word of Almighty God helps us recognize is that when we are focused on doing God's will, when we do God's will, God's blessings of renewal and revival come about what you're saying Reverend let me move quickly I don't want you to miss it because we need to be aware y'all is that because we are in a pandemic we have to be more excited and more dedicated to get released from God's word with all of the bad news and all of the bad media happening to us we need to be rooted in the good news of Jesus Christ why because what is on your mind becomes what is in your heart. Your mind must be rooted on what you're going. Whatever your mind is thinking, that's the actions you will. Okay, come here, Snoop Dogg from Gin and Juice. What did he say? My mind's on my money and my money's on my mind. Somebody knows what I'm saying. When you're thinking about things long enough, your actions will lead in that direction. What you focus on and meditate on the most is what's going to come to your mind. What you feed is what grows. That's what Lisa Nichols says. Lisa Nichols in her motivation, y'all, she says energy grows where energy goes. It says reprogram your thoughts and take charge of your emotions. Recognizing, my friends, is that you have to control your Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. The spiritual minded folk in this text, y'all, Paul is saying is that I'm going to drop some things in your heart and in your spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Let me move quickly because I don't want you to miss the point. The text says that I will give you a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Paul is addressing Timothy's personally and individually. He's affectionately calling him my beloved child. But while this letter again written to Timothy serves as a salutation and a benediction, Paul does not want him to miss the fact that the gospel message is one of grace, mercy, and peace. Grace, mercy, and peace. You need to recognize that this is what the foundation of the faith is about. God's grace, God's mercy, and God's peace. God's grace, grace giving us more than we could ever ask for. God's mercy not giving us what we deserve. And God's peace, the peace that passes all understanding. When you are called by God, your message is not about you, it's about grace, mercy, and peace. The text helps us know that you have to recognize that God is calling you to a great work. God is calling you to perform a great service, and God is calling you to do even greater things. You see, a threefold encouragement comes from this text. Number one, Paul adapted an attitude of of gratitude. Paul opened up the letter saying, when I 
think of you, I thank God for you. When I think of you, I thank God for your presence. When I think of you, I cannot help to have a sense of gratitude in my heart. Hear what I'm saying, friends. When you think about God, you ought to be grateful for everything God does in your life. When you think about what God has brought you through, you can't help but to remember that God is still with you. The second thing, Paul, y'all, he cultivates a heart of worship, a heart of worship. That's where it is he's telling young Timothy, the God whom I serve. Primary purpose, y'all, of worship is to service to Almighty God. The primary purpose of their service was to worship. Again, if you're not going to serve, don't worship. And if you don't worship, don't serve. Let me say it like that. You've got to put both of them together. It's not just lifting up holy hands and speaking in tongues and shouting hallelujahs. You've got to get some boots to the ground. You've got to get some mud on your elbows. You've got to get some stuff on your clothes if you're going to serve all mighty God. Paul is saying the threefold engagement here is to serve all mighty God. Thirdly, Paul is saying we have to maintain a clear consciousness, have a clear mind about this. There is no better way to relieve anxiety than to do what is right always. You, there is no better way that, that you can focus on doing a good thing than to have a clear consciousness in your mind. Do not get so inundated, y'all, with, again, the alphabet network, CNN, ABC, CBS, and do not get so focused on that that you forget the B-I-B-L-E. Do not get so focused on updates and downloads that you forget about falling on your knees and lifting up hands to God and says, Father, not my will, but let thy will be done. I got to give a shout out to Lou Holtz who gave that famous quote. He says, there is never a right time to do wrong thing and never a wrong time to do the right thing. Never a right time to do the wrong thing and never a wrong time to do the right thing. Now is the time for us as believers in Almighty God to do the right thing. Here's what I'm saying. There are certain qualities produced by the Holy Spirit. In this text, Paul is saying those qualities are power, love, and a sound mind. Power, love, and a sound mind. Deutimus power. Come on, theologians. That's that, that Greek word for a supernatural ability to do great things. It says agape love. That's unconditional love. That is unselfish love. That is unlimited love. That is the kind of love that God told us to love one another. And the discipline, that is a rational, sound mind. Rational, sound mind helps you step into areas where you normally would not step into. A rational, sound mind helps you become the person that God wants you to be. A rational, sound mind gives you the kind of fortitude and the kind of push that the late Dr. Gayrod S. Wilmore did in his life. Got to give a shout out to my former seminary professor, Dr. G Dr. Gayrod S. Wilmore, the author of the book Black and Presbyterian. Dr. Wilmore pushed the Presbyterian church back in the 60s to take a strong stance, y'all, against racism. Dr. Wilmore, that Presbyterian pastor from Pennsylvania, graduate of Lincoln University, he had a, a master's degree from Lincoln, that Dr. Gilmore, one of the Buffalo soldiers, original Buffalo soldier serving in a segregated army, found himself becoming a theologian, and Dr. Wilmore pushed us to do just talking about religion, but to live out religion. And Dr. Gilmore, along with Dr. Jim Cohn in that infamous book, Black Religion and Black Radicalism, began to push the envelope, the envelope that helped us recognize that it is in reading and writing that we can make a stance. Dr. Gilmore, he helped to be known to us all is that it's not just talking about it, it's about 
being about it. In essence, you have faith, you have power, love, and a strong mind. Hear what I'm saying today, friends. Paul is dropping a word into our spirits like nobody's business. And it's Paul giving us these words of encouragement that once we get a power, love, and a sound mind, we are to develop, we are to discover, and we are to distribute. Okay, let me say it like this. When you have a power, love, and a sound mind, you need to learn to develop the gifts that God has given us. You need to discover the gifts, excuse me, God has given us, develop where God has placed us, and distribute the blessings God is invested in us. You have to do what again? Discover that gift. What is that gift that God has blessed you with? What is that opportunity that God is taking you to? What, what is it that you are going through right now that makes you better on the other side? You got to discover that gift. Next, you got to develop the place right where you are. Quit talking about what I'm going to do when we get out of the pandemic. You need to discover God has you in a pandemic for such a time as this. Quit talking about when we get back to church. You got to be the church right where you are. If it takes you driving over here to Statesville Avenue just to have church, don't come no more if you got to drive just to have church. You need to have church right where you are and come here and help celebrate church. You got to discover that God is working in your life in a special way and finally you've got to distribute the blessings that God has invested in you distribute those blessings share those blessings give out those blessings don't hold on to the blessings you have to open up your how does one say I thank you with your arms outstretched how the one how does one give it gives with an open hand recognize this y'all is that Paul says that God is not giving you the spirit of fear because you have overcome fear. God is not giving you the spirit of doubt. You have overcome doubt. God is not giving you the spirit of confusion. You have overcome confusion. How can you say that? Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What does the Bible tell us is that when you accept and receive Christ in to your life. In essence, my friends, you are delivered from those fears. You are delivered from those troubles. You are delivered from that pain. You are delivered from that agonizing confusion. You are whatever it is that holds you in bondage. When you accept Christ into your life, you have been delivered from those things. And the good news, once you are delivered, you recognize your struggle. You understand your struggle. You don't confuse things that your struggle is bringing you. You give God thanks that in the struggle, all things are possible to those that believe in Almighty God. Let me see if I can close by sharing a very important but a very impactful story I read about Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Dr. Condoleezza Rice wrote an article, y'all, on the privilege of struggle. Dr. Condoleezza Rice, you remember her as the first African-American female to serve as a Secretary of State of the United States of America, a phenomenal college professor, a phenomenal businesswoman, a phenomenal contributor to the society that makes it a better place. Dr. Condoleezza Rice says is that we are living through a time of testing and consequences, a praying that our wisdom and will will equal to the work before us all. She says at this time, times like these, we are reminded of a paradox, and that is a privilege to struggle. Again, it's a paradox to say it's a privilege to struggle, but what Dr. Rice says is a privilege to struggle for what is right and what is true. It's a privilege to struggle for freedom over tyranny. It's a privilege to struggle even with the most difficult and profound moral choices. She says that that you got to realize that our ancestors, African American ancestors who were enslaved used to sing a song, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. How can you ask that to be a joyous song. How can you say 
glory, hallelujah, after going through trouble, after going through beatings, after going through lynchings, after being separated from one another. But our ancestors recognize is that it's the struggle that seemed to be a contradiction to some folk really made them stronger. Dr. Rice says she goes back to Romans chapter 5, which simply says, for we glory in tribulations, for tribulations work, work of experience, experience hope, and hope makes us not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dr. Rice, oh, did I mention she's the daughter of a Presbyterian pastor who graduated from Johnson C. Smith University here? Did I mention that as a Presbyterian, she found herself growing up saying and doing the things that we do as Presbyterian? Did I mention this first African-American woman who was the Secretary of State of the United States of America uh, understood that Jesus loves this? I know for the Bible tells me so. You see, when you understand the text, you cannot help but to understand what Horatio Spafford wrote in that great story about it is well with my soul. You see, he was an attorney and he was a preacher, but he went through loss. He went through struggle. He went through some tough times. Horatio Spafford, y'all, lost four children in a, in a shipwreck, shipwreck, and he lamented his sorrows like sea billows roll. His sorrows like sea billows roll. He says, it is well with my soul. How can somebody lose children and still say it is well? Well, I believe they can sin it is well. Like many of you sing, it is well. As you face cancer treatment, as you face depression, as you face layoffs, as you face furloughs, you can still say, as for me and my house, it is well with my soul. Like most of those who are time tested in the Bible, every time you open up the word, you see God working things out. Every time you read truth, you see God God coming through. Every time you recognize that you have some fear, God says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Y'all, that's worth giving God praise for. That's worth giving God thanks for. That's worth giving God a hallelujah for. That regardless of what goes on on the outside, I know deep in my heart, it is well with my soul. It's well with my soul. It's well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, it is well with my soul. Let this blessed assurance that Christ have regarded my helpless estate, it is well with my soul. And have he shed his own blood for my soul? It is well. So friends, stand on the word. Stay in truth. Stay on your knees. Don't give up. Don't go to fear. But God has given us a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. And when you know that, it is well with my soul. invite you now to join us as we pray. God, we thank you for how you've spoken to us today, and we ask your blessings to continue to stir up the gift, to remind us not to live in fear, but to live with the power, the love, and the sound mind that comes from being in relationship with you. God, we pray that someone has heard this word today, and if someone is reminded that in their struggle, 
You are making them to have the beauty of the butterfly. But most importantly, God, you are making them into something that only they can become. God, we pray for those who are struggling to make it from day to day. God, those struggling with health issues. God, those who are struggling living in a domestic violent situation. God, those who struggle to make ends meet. God, those who struggle to have peace. God, they have a bed, but they cannot get sleep. God, they have food, but they have no appetite. God, they have a house, but it's not a home. So we pray, God, that whatever the struggle is, that you will allow them to know that it can be well with their soul when they release and turn it over to you. God, we pray this Sunday morning that somebody has heard this word and will confess with their mouth that they need you as their Lord. God, we pray that someone has received this word and will turn from their wicked and sinful ways. God, we pray that someone who may have felt distant from the church now feel that there's some closeness as they reach out and they watch it on the internet, as they watch it on their phones, that the church is not to build and the church is the people. So God, we pray again that you will stir up that gift in us as a people. God, we confess as a church that we've been skinny fat. We've been acting like the world needed to come to us. But in essence, the pandemic has reminded us that the church needs to go to the world. So God, give us strength. Take away any fear and any doubt and any anxieties. And help us, God, to be all that you call us to be. Thank you for someone who makes a decision today. Thank you for someone who recognizes they need to come back to you. Thank you, God, for the many saints who are saying, regardless of the circumstances on the outside, on the inside, it is well with my soul. We ask this prayer in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior, that all who are able say amen. My friends, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being a part of our worship service. Do know that this congregation loves you and it cares about you and it promises to be there for you, not just when you come back to church, but even right now. Please write the church, call the church, connect with us by way of emails. We want to be in connection with you. If you, if you right now want to make a decision, there are pastors online answering your prayer calls, answering your questions. Just simply type in the comment box, let them know what your concerns are. We will do all we can to respond. Please continue to join us with all the many activities. Again, for our youth and young adults, go to the website right now. There's a great youth program coming up right around 11 o'clock and another for children about right after 12. So please tune in. Thank you, parents, for being that guardian like Eunice, being like that grandmother. But thank you, most important, for being the church that goes out and makes a difference. Do know that I love you. On behalf of the pastoral team here, Pastor Lanson and myself, on behalf of all of our officers and leaders, our Christian educator, Dr. Carroll, and so many that make CNG is a great place to worship, we're glad that you joined the day. For our band, our musicians, for all of those who made this a wonderful service, we are grateful for God's love. Do know that this is a great way to start your week. I love you. God loves you. Have a wonderful day.